So I hope um, that all of you are here to learn how to identify your gold and silver treasures. And once again, I'm Carolyn Osuyos. I am here with Elderworks. Um, I want to let you know that we are going to be recording this both on Facebook Live as well as YouTube. So you will have an opportunity to tell some friends in case they miss us this morning. I think most of you know that Elderworks Educational Services is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. We provide older adults, seniors, and families with referrals, guidance on senior living, home care, and a wide variety of other things. Um, this also includes this type of education that we're doing for you today. It is open to the public. It is always complimentary. We also provide education for our licensed professionals, those uh, nurses, social workers, and so on. So without further ado, I just want to let you know we're going to be here for up to an hour talking about how to identify your gold and silver treasures. And I'm pleased to introduce you to David Kaz of DMK Metal. David has a passion for precious metals. He actually worked as a bag boy at his grandparents' Rogers Park grocery store in the 70s. David was fascinated by the silver dimes, quarters, half dollars, and war nickels that would appear in the cash register. He exchanged the modern version for the silver change, and that started his 40 plus year interest in silver and gold. He's been actively purchasing unwanted gold and silver items from clients at the highest prices for the past five years, and he enjoys educating all of us on the value of their gold and silver jewelry, sterling flatware, coins, and more. And just on a personal note, when I got to know David, um, he encouraged me to find my loose change jar, which I did, and I was pleasantly surprised um, to go through the, the coins in there and find that quite a few of them were more than their face value. So without further ado, here is David Kaz of DMK Metal. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, for that great introduction. Thank you. Uh, big thank you to Elderworks for inviting me to deliver this presentation today. Uh, as Carolyn said, I am uh, David Kaz, president and precious metal buyer at DMK Metal. Uh, basically, I work with clients who have unwanted gold and silver, and I buy the uh, items that they don't uh, want, their kids, grandkids don't want at the highest prices. And as I go, I really enjoy educating uh, my clients about their items, how to look for their items. So that's the big focus of our presentation today. How can you identify those items that you own that might have a lot of value? So some of the more common items that uh, my clients have, uh, the, the most common, of course, is jewelry gold, silver, jewelry, costume jewelry. Uh, so as you look around the house, that is definitely the most common. Also, uh, probably still in the jewelry category are watches, uh, gold and silver watches. Uh, flatware, I buy a lot of sterling flatware, sterling serving pieces, and it's not always easy to identify which are sterling and which are, uh, which are plated. Uh, dental, so uh, gold and silver are both used in, for dental purposes. Uh, silver, although if you have any teeth with uh, silver fillings, they're not worth that much, but gold crowns, bridges are definitely worth a lot of money. And then coins and bullion, uh, old coins that might be laying around, like Carolyn mentioned, how do you identify which ones actually have uh, gold and silver in them? So the first thing you want to do is get yourself a very powerful, strong magnet. Uh, gold and silver do not stick to a magnet. Now that is not 100% universal because your jewelry, your watches, your other items are uh, alloys. They're mixed with other metals, but it's pretty, uh, pretty accurate, uh, but it is the first test. So here's an example of uh, two earrings, one that sticks, one that does not stick. So the one on the left-hand side that doesn't stick has a chance of being gold. Now the magnet is not 100% uh, definitive, that one does have a chance. The one that's sticking very strongly to the magnet that you can see held up, definitely 
uh, is not uh, gold, it's gold plated. Now here are two gold uh, rope chains and I have them here as well that I use for my photograph. So they both are gold, gold colored. They look like the real deal. Now the first one, this thicker one, you'll see that as I hold it to the magnet that it sticks. And when that happens, I'm pretty confident that this is gold plated, gold filled, but not 14 or 18 karat gold. Now this other rope chain, as you'll see, does not stick. Let's make sure I can see it on video. So I hold that near my magnet, you see it doesn't stick. Now that's not a guarantee that it's gold, but now it's got a very good chance of being gold. So again, first thing that you can do is get yourself a very powerful magnet. Now second and probably more importantly is get yourself a uh, loop or magnifying glass. So this is an example of a jeweler's loop. Uh, this is an example of a magnifying glass, strong magnifying glass. And uh, what are we looking for? So let's uh, delve in a little bit. So first, let me take you back to uh, grade school and fractions. So when it comes to gold, you all uh, know the terms 10 karat, 14 karat, 18 karat, but what does that mean? So in gold, the denominator, what you divide by is 24. So if you divide 24 by 24, you get one or 100%. So pure 100% gold is 24 karat gold. We all have heard of, of 24 karat. So now think about 10 karat, 14 karat gold. So with 10 karat, divide 10 by 24 and you get 0.417. So 10 karat gold is 41.7% gold. 14 karat gold is four, you know, 14 divided by 24 equals 585, 0.585. That is 58 and a half percent gold. 18 karat gold is 0.75 or 75% gold. 22 karat gold, if you know anybody from India or who've traveled there, you get very yellow uh, colored gold, very buttery. It's 22 divided by 24 gives you uh, 0.917. Now also, uh, you could look at it as 917 parts per thousand are gold and so forth. So what are you looking for on your jewelry? So if it's a 10 karat necklace, a ring, bracelet, uh, almost everybody who's got a class ring, it says 10K. So you're looking for 10K or you're looking for the number 417. So that tells you that that item is uh, 10 karat gold. On 14 karat gold, you're looking for 585 or 14 k now, 16 karat dental gold, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Here's an example of a gold crown. <laughs> uh, it's usually 16 karat gold, and, but you won't see a stamp on uh, dental gold. So uh, there's other things, other tests that we would talk about. 18 karat gold, you'll see uh, 750 or 18K. 22 karat gold, you'll see 917. Now, there is 24 karat gold out there. It usually will say 999, so 999 parts per thousand uh, gold, or it might say 24 karat. And you'll see some images over there of what you're looking for. Now, sometimes on necklaces, bracelets, uh, it's very hard to see where the 14K or the 585, et cetera, is located. So here's that bracelet I showed you earlier. And if you look closely, you'll see this tag. Hopefully you can, I don't know if you'll be able to read it. But whenever you see this oval tag, that's usually a pretty good sign that it is gold. And then you'll look with your magnifying glass at that tag. Now also on things like bracelets, you might see the 585 stamped on the clasp itself. So again, very small. It's amazing how small they can get that marker. Uh, when you uh, have a, a 24 karat gold piece of jewelry, usually that's coming from Asia. And if you look at the second to bottom uh, right image, it's kind of a serpentine class. That usually tells me that that item is 24 karat gold. So again, you'll have to look uh, on your jewelry, different locations to find either that, uh, that number that signifies the percentage or the carat marker. Now, when we're talking about earrings or uh, pins or brooches, it's even more challenging to find that 14K or 585. So as you look at some of these images, you'll see that in most cases with earrings, the marker is on the post that goes into your ear, very, very small. So that's why you need such a powerful magnifying glass to find it. Also, you could find it on the backing, but usually if an earring is uh, gold, the backing will be gold as well. However, whenever I buy these uh, type of items, a lot of times the backing gets lost, so you never know if um, 
if the backing is gold or not. Uh, although I know, as I bring a magnet, those little backings will stick to this magnet, then I know they're not gold. Uh, also on a pin or a brooch, in most cases, it'll be on the actual thin pin itself where you'll see the marker or on the part of the pin where, the, uh, where it goes in uh, to keep you safe from getting stabbed. Now, how about on watches? So I've got some samples of gold watches. So here is an uh, old Movado that's gold. So in most cases on a watch, you'll see the mark up on the rim on the back of the watch. Now, if like this uh, watch, the actual uh, um, band is gold, you should see the 14K on the clasp. Again, I don't know if you can see very well on video, but uh, I believe you can. So this is an example of a watch that not only is the casing gold, but also the band is gold. But you might have a watch where it has a leather band. Uh, this part of the watch is, is never on a leather band. This is not going to be gold. But then you'll find the gold uh, marker up here, the 14K. Now, sometimes with these uh, older watches, you know, these small lady watches, these are watches from the 40s, 50s, and so forth, it might be very hard to see the mark on the back here. It might be worn off from, uh, you know, 50, 70 years of usage. So what you wanted, well, this is what I do. Uh, the backing comes off. I would have a special tool that allows me to take, you know, the watch apart. I have this redone. And then as you take out the mechanism, you can see on the inside that it's marked 14K, 18K, 585, 750, or it might say gold filled or gold plated which is the bad news about that item. Now, what about pocket watches? Pocket watches are interesting. So here's an old actual silver pocket watch. And usually with pocket watches, you have to open the back windows. And in some cases, you'll see the mark on uh, the window here. This one says coin. So this is actually a coin silver pocket watch. Uh, in most cases, you have to open this windows, especially on the gold pocket watches. And you'll see inside written 14K, 18K, 585 or 750. Uh, here's another example of a pocket watch. I brought all kinds of show and tell today. So with this type of pocket watch, sometimes you have what's called a screw back where you have to actually unscrew the backing, which is sometimes not so easy. So you can see it unscrews. And then on the inside, you'll see that it might say 14K, 18K. Now, if you see 10, 20, 25 years uh, guaranteed, warranted, what that means is the gold plating is guaranteed to last without falling off for 10, 20, 25 years. So that's bad news when you see that. Now, if it says lifetime warranty, that's usually a good thing because that means the gold, which it's solid gold, will last for a lifetime. So that's a little bit about watches. Watches are uh, sometimes tricky. Now, oh, also, if you look in the lower left image, uh, there are some watches out there that are made from old uh, gold coins. And if those are real gold coins, they're not going to be marked 90% uh, gold. But old U.S. coins, and I'll talk about this more later, were 90% gold. So if you have a gold watch that's made from an old U.S. gold coin, it is 90% gold. All right, here's uh, one of my favorite topics is dental gold. So dental gold is usually, well, always somewhere between 10 and 18 carat. It's usually 16 carat. So here is an old crown. Now, if these uh, dental, if these old teeth are more yellow, they're probably a higher carat. That's usually if uh, someone came from Europe, they used a higher carat gold, more gold content in the gold teeth. But you'll see we've got a four tooth bridge as an example. We've got old dentures since gold does not degrade. Uh, it's great for dental purposes. So they actually use gold for the dentures. Today, of course, it's all plastic. And then they put the fake teeth into the gold. So I bought uh, several of those old dentures. You can see fillings, really gross. That top uh, right picture, I've bought uh, plenty of dental gold where it comes along with the teeth. And it's pretty shocking to see how deep those roots actually go are law are for some people. So kind of gross, but uh, it's really good gold. Those are valuable. You know, one crown, something like this could be worth anywhere from maybe $50 to $100. A bridge could be, you know, worth, you know, several hundred. A, uh, those old uh, dentures could be worth, you know, upwards of $1,000. Again, it's all based on the gold weight. So if you've got old gold teeth laying around, they definitely have a lot of value. All right, so since, you know, we kind of covered with carrot, 
that there's only, you know, 14 carat is 58.5% gold. So what is the other 42%? Uh, so that is known as an alloy. So you alloy the gold, you mix gold with other metals. So those other metals include silver, zinc, copper. Now, if you have any rose gold where it's more reddish or you have Black Hills gold, uh, usually that means there's more copper in it. Uh, nickel is another metal. If you have an item that's white gold, so white gold does not, um, it's the same value as yellow gold. It just means that they put more of uh, the type of alloy that would turn it that silver color. So that could be more platinum, silver, palladium, rhodium, iridium. Uh, all of those metals, those precious metals are silver. Gold is actually the only golden colored uh, precious metal. But if you mix enough of those uh, with the yellow gold, it turns it silver or white. Uh, now you could, if you've got some old gold jewelry, you don't like the gold color anymore, you could get it rhodium plated. So if you go to a uh, specialist who can put it in a rhodium bath, it would coat that uh, yellow gold with a thin microscopic layer of rhodium. So it does turn it to white gold on the outside. But if you do that process, just be aware that that will rub off over time. So if something is white gold, it is that same white or silver color through and through all the way through. Whereas if you have uh, it plated, then that plating could come off and the yellow will come through after you know, a year, a couple of years, whatever the case may be. So now, what if you can't see a stamp on the item? Uh, you, you know, maybe you've got a bracelet like this, but the clasp or the bag broke off and you don't know, is it gold? Uh, that's why a person like uh, a gold and silver buyer like myself will bring an acid test kit with me. And uh, I don't have enough time to really go through how all that works. And that's probably, you know, getting a little bit more detailed than you need. But having the acid test kit allows me to test an item either to confirm that truly is gold, because I have found plenty of uh, fakes out there where it's been stamped and it really isn't gold, or maybe it's got that gold marker on it, but someone added it onto an actual gold filled or gold plated piece. So the acids allow me to tell, is it real? And then what carat is it? Is it 10, 14, 18, 22, 24 carat? It also allows me to, to uh, test for silver. Now, these are some of the things uh, are, that are sad news that you don't want to see on an item, but these are ways to tell if your gold is actually gold filled or gold plated. So if you ever see a fraction like 1 20th 14K, 1 20th 12K, uh, that means it's the, the, the actual uh, plating is only 1 20th gold, not the item itself. So whenever you see that fraction, and really, whenever you see 12K, there's nothing that I've ever found that is uh, 12K. It might be out there. I have found 13K jewelry, some antique stuff. If you see KGF, it means gold filled. Uh, obviously, if it says gold filled, like on the back of some of these old uh, watches that I've got laying around, they're going to say gold filled or um, gold plated. Uh, I mentioned earlier, if you've got a pocket watch like this one where it says warranted for 20 years, again, that means the plating. If you see uh, HGE, that means plated. If you see that pear-shaped tag, uh, usually, that always means that it's plated. And those type of jewelry items where you see that pear-shaped tag stick very strongly, even more. You see how this one sticks? But if it like wraps itself around the magnet, then you know that that is plated. So these are the sad things that we see on uh, jewelry, but it is something to look for. Now let's talk about silver. Silver is more challenging than gold to identify. And uh, sterling gold is actually 92.5% silver. And the other 7.5% is usually copper or zinc, or again, it's, it's alloyed with something else for that other 7.5%. Uh, so with a sterling item, you're either looking for the word, so here's a silver spoon. So you're either looking for the word sterling. Again, I can't tell if you can, hopefully you can read that. Uh, here's another sterling from a different flatware set. So you're looking for the word sterling or you're looking for the number 925. And most uh, sterling jewelry out there, like you see an image here, most sterling jewelry actually does say uh, 925, but again, a lot of it says sterling. Uh, just like with gold jewelry, you'll find it on a clasp, you'll find it on tags. Um, now with 
antique silver. So I brought a couple of pieces. Uh, you may see a number. Oh, here we go. This is, uh, let's see if you can see this. This one actually says 900. Let's see, holding up there. So hopefully you can see it actually says 0, 0,900. So that means 900 parts per thousand silver. So it's not sterling, but it's almost sterling. It's 90% silver instead of 92.5%. And some uh, items you might see the number 700, 800, 835. That does mean 800 parts per thousand silver, 830, 835 parts per uh, thousand silver. Now with some older pieces or some imported pieces from Europe, you may not see any numbers and you may not see the word sterling. So that's where you're looking for uh, a lion, a panther, a king or a queen. And I'll go into more detail on that here shortly. Uh, also, if something's coin silver, now you remember I mentioned that this pocket watch whoop, is uh, coin silver and it actually says coin. So again, squint, you might need a magnifying glass to see what the video is telling you. But uh, it might say the word coin or you might see um, an eagle, so an eagle hallmark, and that eagle means coin silver. All right, so here, let's get into more detail. So these are the different types of hallmarks that you're looking for, uh, especially when you don't see Sterling or 925. So if you look at a bunch of these different hallmarks, you'll see the side image of a lion. And I'm gonna show you, this is a old antique European silver, and you can see that lion right there. You'll see that he's a little bit more worn down because it's an old used piece, a little antique, uh, probably creamer. Uh, so that lion, signifies sterling and there's a different lion whether the item came from england from germany from denmark different countries but it's always that full body lion profile and you'll see that the second image on the left down the lion's actually looking at you where the other one is looking straight forward but when you see that full body side view of a lion i think this piece uh this one's even more worn but you'll see if i zoom in there you see a lion now you might also see a panther head. Sometimes the panther has a crown on his head, sometimes he doesn't. So as you look at some of these images, you'll see panthers in those uh, four hallmarks. Uh, you might also see a profile of a king or queen, you know, some member of royalty that also signifies uh, to you that, uh, that it is sterling. And you're also going to see the fourth of the hallmark, and this is not always the case, but you might see here, an actual letter, a Roman numeral letter. I know this one for sure has it. That Roman numeral, numeral letter that's within a geometric shape like a shield or a square or an oval, that actually tells you the date. So here I think you see a P in kind of a shield shape. So you need to look up and you can find it on the internet, but it's very challenging. Uh, you can kind of find out where this was made, uh, who the maker was, and what year it was made. So, and then if you look at the, the lower right, you'll see that's the eagle I was talking about that you'll find on a coin silver item. So ideally you see the, um, the word sterling or the number 925, but European silver, especially antique silver, you're gonna have to look, uh, is a little bit more challenging. Now here's an item that uh, a lot of us have candlesticks. Here's a candelabra. I might have to hold it back, this one's big. Candelabra, here's a serving piece. And as you flip it over and look on the bottom, you might see the word sterling weighted or sterling reinforced. And uh, what does that mean? So here, I'm gonna zoom in on this one as well. And hopefully you guys are able to read this. But sterling reinforced or sterling weighted, there's actually a chunk of cement in here. And then there's also a steel or a metal post inside of here. And what does that allow me to do when I put it on a table? Since it's a light amount of sterling, it doesn't tip over as easily. So sterling weighted will keep whatever the item is more firmly on your table. And it's also a cheaper way to go because it was solid sterling, it's worth far more. So if you look at uh, the images here, I've got a couple of old uh, sterling weighted candlestick holders. They say uh, weighted and reinforced on the bottom, actually. I put it on the scale, and you see that it says 9.33 troy ounces. Then I take it apart using a wire cutter, and it's really just a thin 
aluminum foil layer of sterling around that weight. So as I peel it off, you can see that it's really, it's aluminum foil uh, thickness. And then after I take that sterling, uh, can, that sterling weighted piece apart and weigh just the sterling part, that's down to about an ounce. So when it comes to sterling weighted items, usually, well, it's usually somewhere between 10 to 30% sterling. This one would be a higher percent sterling because up here, this part is sterling. This part is sterling weighted. Uh, so something like this might be 25% sterling, whereas that candlestick was only, was really only uh, less than 10% was sterling. All right, so what's the bad news? The bad news is when we've got items that are sterling plated. So when something is plated, it's called electroplated. It's a process to put a very microscopic layer of silver around a base metal. So it, there is some silver in that item, but it's very a very minute amount. So what are you looking for to kind of uh, show that something's plated? You might see EP, that means electroplated. EPNS means electroplated nickel silver. Uh, EPBM, electroplated base metal. SPS, you might see silver over copper. You might see silver over nickel. You might see something that says triple plated, quadruple plated. I don't care if it's a hundred plated, it's still plated. And unfortunately it has a very low uh, value. It's not zero value, but a low amount of value. You might see the word community. You might see A1, A2, B1, B2. If you look at some of these photos, you see what looks like uh, a lion, but it looks actually more like a dragon. It's a very shallow. Uh, that usually tells me that it's plated as opposed to that uh, profile of a full body of a lion. Uh, you might see the word plateado. It looks like I spelled wrong, but that is Spanish for plated. So, uh, and if you really can't find the hallmark on an item, that's usually uh, plated as well. Usually when something's sterling, it says it very proudly on it. Um, so you'll see sterling very easily on those items that are sterling. All right, so Carolyn talked about coins uh, at, during that introduction. So let's talk a little bit about coins and bullion. So first would be uh, US coins, which you might have in your, uh, I'm assuming you've got coin jars, uh, you've got your drawers, junk drawers, I know I do, filled with coins. So 1964 and before, so pre-65 dimes, quarters, and half dollars and silver dollars were 90% silver. So uh, as Carolyn mentioned, when I worked in, uh, at Mickey's Certified in Rogers Park back in the 70s, uh, I would look in the cash register and find old dimes and quarters. So here's, for example, two old dimes. You've got a mercury dime, but you've also got uh, a Roosevelt dime. So 1964 and before, these were 90% silver. You might have old quarters that were 90% silver. Old half dollars. So I've got some samples here. Here's a uh, Franklin that was from the 40s and 50s. Walking Liberty, 40, I think they stopped making these in 45 and before. Um, then you've got also silver dollars. So you've got, this is a peace dollar that they made from 22 to 35. There's a Morgan from the 1870s through 1921. So these were, and they're called junk silver, but they definitely are not junk. They're 90% silver, worth quite a bit. Uh, so the silver quarter based on where silver is right now is worth about four bucks. So back in 1964, a gallon of gas was one quarter and all the quarters were silver. So it was one silver quarter. Today, this could buy you two gallons of gas. So gasoline has actually gone way down in price based on silver, but way up in price based on the dollar that is no longer tied to silver. Now, these silver dollars, I mentioned that they stopped producing these in 1935. And then in 1971, they started making Eisenhower dollars that had no silver in them. Uh, there were also gold coins in the US and they stopped production in 1933. So those gold coins were 90% gold and 10% copper. And the $20 gold piece was very close to one troy ounce of gold. And uh, then you could divide it from there. So uh, one troy ounce of gold was in a 20, a $10 gold piece at a half, a $5 was a quarter and so forth. And today you could invest in uh, gold and silver eagles. And if you look at the image over there, you'll notice that the silver eagle is almost double the size of the gold eagle. And that's because gold is almost double the density of silver. 
So a one ounce gold coin is much smaller than a one ounce uh, silver coin. And you see images over there. So those are the gold and silver eagles. Now there were also uh, coins all over the world made out of gold and silver. There were sovereigns, pesos, marks, francs, rupees, uh, Canadian, uh, uh, even nickels had silver in them. Dimes, quarters had silver dollars on the Canada up until 1969 had silver. Uh, they went down from, uh, I believe they were 80% down to 50%. So it depends on the year. We'll tell you how much silver in them. Uh, there was silver really globally in the coinage. Uh, all countries had silver coins and there were uh, many countries that had gold coins. This is an example of a gold uh, two peso coin. It's about the size of a dime. Again, I apologize if it's not uh, as focused as I'd like it to be, but this is close to about a 10th ounce of gold in this two peso uh, gold coin from Mexico. Uh, but globally, there was uh, pretty much a gold and silver by uh, metal standard and uh, countries all over the globe had gold and silver coinage. Now, currently, if you wanted to invest in gold and silver, which I do recommend, uh, many countries issue uh, government issued coins from their uh, mints. So in the United States, we have the gold and silver eagle. In Canada, we have the maple leaf. In South Africa, the most popular gold coins were Krugerrands, but there's also silver Krugerrands. In China, they have the Panda. Out of Austria, they have the Philharmonic. Mexico are Libertads. Uh, Australia, Kangaroos. And out of Great Britain are the Britannias. And all of these coins are issued in one troy ounce, but they also have half ounce, some have tenth of an ounce. And what's nice is gold and silver is worth the same, whether it's an eagle, a maple leaf, leaf or Krugerrand. So they truly are interchangeable no matter where you are in the world. Uh, one ounce of gold is worth the same amount no matter where you are. Now, what about bullion? With bullion, we're talking about uh, gold and silver bars as well as gold and silver rounds, which are what they're called. So you can buy today one ounce uh, gold bars, 10 ounce, you can buy one kilo, you can buy 100 ounce gold bars. And with gold very close to 2,000 an ounce, you're talking about $2,000 for just a little one ounce bar. A 10 ounce is gonna be about $20,000. So uh, gold bars are, I don't find them out there very frequently, uh, very valuable. And uh, a lot of times they're issued by the, uh, the mint of that country. Like here you see Credit Suisse uh, made by the Swiss Central Bank. Uh, but with silver bars and silver rounds, uh, many refineries, many mints out there create uh, these type of items. So you might find one ounce, 10 ounce, 100 ounce, 1000 ounce silver bars. You can find the rounds made by many different mints across the United States. They might have images of old presidents. They might have images of uh, baseball players, uh, just specialty coins. Uh, a lot of you might own coins made by the Franklin Mint. And uh, Franklin Mint, they might be either pure silver. They might be 90% silver. They might be sterling, 92.5%. Uh, a lot of times I'll have images of, you know, here you can see uh, great Americans or great paintings throughout history. Uh, unfortunately, most of those do not have any value beyond the silver content, so they still are quite valuable, but not necessarily as collectibles, more so as uh, for their gold and silver content. Now, when it comes to old gold and silver coins, if they have more value than the silver or gold content, then uh, those would be uh, uh, called numismatics. So numismatics uh, is the study and the understanding of the value of coins and if something has numismatic value, it could be based on its scarcity or uh, based on its quality. So if something was never circulated or maybe it's uh, set, you know, here's a Morgan, if on the bottom below you'll see the mint mark and it might be an S, a P, an O. So S is San Francisco, P is Philadelphia. But if you see a CC, that means Carson City. So back in the 1870s, there were some Morgans minted at the Carson City Mint, but those are more scarce. So while it might only be about $20, $25 of silver, it could be worth several hundred, if not thousands of dollars based on its scarcity. So that's numismatics. So that's my presentation. Uh, I know I left a lot of time here for questions. Uh, of course, if you don't, uh, if you think of questions later today, later in the week, whatever, you can get a hold of me through my uh, website, which is dmkmetal.net. You can go to my contact me uh, webpage on that site. 
where I do uh, allow you to submit uh, questions. You can even upload photos of items you have. You can say, hey, David, what is this? Is it valuable? Uh, here you've got my email address, david at dmkmetal.net. You've also got my cell phone number, 847-508-0224. So if you've got any items you want to talk about, give me a call, email me. You could text me photos of items. Uh, very happy to answer questions at any time. And uh, you know, that's my presentation, but I left plenty of time for Q&A. So Carolyn, if hopefully people have questions. We, the questions are coming in. Oh, so okay. The very first one, Denise wants to know where she can purchase a loop. Oh, okay. That's a good question. So <laughs> you can go to uh, hobby stores and uh, they have magnifying glasses there. Now they may not have the most powerful ones. Like if you went to a Hobby Lobby or something like that. So I would always recommend go to Amazon. You can buy anything on Amazon. So I bought, you know, this one on Amazon really is not that expensive. Uh, when you look at this one, this one has on it a 10 times, a 20 times. So that's 10 times power, 20 times, 50 times. So this like little area, if you've got a very small mark, you could use that and see very close up. This is more of a jeweler's loop. Now these could be anywhere from, you know, $10 up to, you know, several hundred dollars. And the several hundred dollars are more for diamond uh, experts who are looking to see flaws in diamonds. But again, I recommend Amazon, a hobby store, and uh, you can definitely find those. Okay, great. So what about, um, with all jewelry, you did cover this a little bit, but it's going yep. back to the markings. Will all jewelry be marked? I would say yes, at least originally, originally. So if it is truly gold, when it was created by that uh, jeweler, it, uh, it was stamped, but the stamp could fall off. You know, I bought so many rings where people have worn them for 50 years, or maybe they inherited it where their relative wore it for 50, so it's been worn 100 years. So on the inside, the 14K has worn off. That's why you need that, um, you need that acid, or I need that acid test kit to make sure. But yes, everything was initially originally marked. It just could have worn off. It could have been modified. I think, you know, just to kind of re regroup. I mean, this is, again, let's hold it up here. This is that bracelet. Whoop. So let's see if I can get it to stop shaking. So if it said 585 on the original class, but the class broke and you went to a jeweler and that jeweler replaced the class that said 14K with a one that's kind of a cheapie, that, and that was the only way to identify it was gold, then that was gone away. You know, that, that tag might've, you know, gone with the class. So long story short, yes, everything was originally marked, but that doesn't mean you can find the mark today, unfortunately. Great. Okay, so Diane wants to know what is the price per ounce for silver today? <laughs> all right, well, let me break out my phone because I look at it all day long and you could go to many, there's many different websites. So you can go to kitco.com, K-I-T-C-O, which is where I'm going to take you right now. And you I've heard of Kitco. Is that the one you recommend? Yeah. Yeah, but there's there's several out there now. I don't know if you're seeing that. Carolyn, are you seeing that backwards or are you seeing it? No, we're seeing it forwards, but it's oh, okay. still a little hard for <laughs> you can go ahead and translate for us. All right. Well but yeah, backwards to right me, there. but there you can see it says gold and silver. So yeah. silver right now is at twenty four dollars and seventeen cents. Okay. And gold is at eighteen hundred and sixty three dollars. You can see gold is kind of, it's down 14 bucks today, which always makes me cry a little bit. I'll try not to cry on video. Uh, but that goes, you know, gold and silver, that's called the spot price. And that goes up and down all day long, every day during the week with the markets. And that's based on troy ounces. Troy ounces are a little bit heavier than regular ounces. So there's 31 grams per troy ounce. And there's 20 penny weight. So penny weight is 1 20th of ounce. But when you're looking at gold and silver, that is the, uh, that's the troy ounce price. Okay. Well, that was helpful. Uh, Sandra want, it has the situation. My husband has old trays and trophies won in competitions. Yeah. What markings or wording would make these have any value? Yeah. If not worded, are they worth anything? <sighs> Well, no matter what, they're priceless based on uh, what a champion he is. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that being said, um, usually with sterling items made in the U.S., they say sterling. 
and chances are he was, you know, got earned those in the United States. Uh, so turn the item over. I wish I had some trays, but let's just say that this was a tray. If you flip it over, you're looking for the hallmark somewhere on the bottom. And if it's sterling, it's going to say sterling. Again, if it says, you know, plated, quadruple plated, triple plated, EP, which means electroplated, unfortunately, that means it's plated. If it's very tarnished, it's kind of tough to see sometimes. So you're going to have to get very close up. You know, sometimes it's right in the middle. Sometimes it's up, you know, off center. So you're just going to have to look. And chances are better than not if it says sterling. Well, it is definitely sterling if it says sterling. If it doesn't say sterling, chances are better than not that it's plated. Okay. All right, and Sandra also wanted to offer that she bought four loops at Harbor Freight. Hmm. So, okay, the next question go. is, does a magnet have to be a certain strength to detect gold? Okay, so this one's a very powerful magnet. I got this on Amazon. And I can't think it... know what to look for. So if, you're, yep. if we're doing... Um, Shopping for magnets, what are the key things we should be looking for? So I can't remember the right term, but it, it, they, it, the term they use bases on how much poundage it can lift. So a magnet might be 10 pounds, it might lift 40 pounds. So the more pounds it can lift, the more powerful it is. Oh. And keep in mind that this is not a 100% guarantee test. But, you know, if you, the more powerful the magnet, the more easily it'll stick to the item. Okay. So now this one, you know, with, with my experience of doing this for many years, I, I'm, you know, 99.9% .9 confident that this is gold plated. All right. But when you have silver jewelry, a lot of times if it's a necklace, it might have a wire that is not sterling that's holding charms and beads in place. And that wire might not be sterling, but the beads and the charms are, and, you know, the, uh, you know, whatever's on it are sterling. So don't use the magnet as 100% definitive. Uh, it's pretty good. It gives you good belief that it's going to be plated. Uh, if it sticks very strongly, you know, that's pretty much a guarantee. So with gold, this is plated. With silver, I'm still not 100% sure. So I'm still going to look at the tag and at the clasp on a silver piece of jewelry. Now, sterling flatware does not stick. But plated, plated doesn't stick either. So again... This is not a guarantee. The other thing also to keep in mind with sterling uh, flatware, the knives, the steak knives, this part that you use to cut is stainless steel. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that my magnet sticks very strongly to that part. And then the handle is sterling, right? So it's maybe an, one, a half to one ounce of sterling in the handle. The, uh, the stainless steel shank goes into the item. So you see the magnet sticks there but it does not stick down at the bottom because the, the steel stops right about here. It's in a chunk of cement inside there. So don't let the magnet test tell you that this is not sterling. Don't let anybody else tell you it's a sterling handle. Whereas these, you know, spoons are pure sterling, definitely won't stick. But if they're plated, the, you know, the magnet's not going to test uh, flatware either. Okay. So is there any um, gold in semiconductors these days? The computer boards. <clears throat> so the computer <laughs> boards. And maybe not so much anymore. No, there still is. So, so gold and silver are the best conductors of electricity. So every circuit board, every cell phone, every computer board, motherboard, every chip has gold and silver in it. Uh, now the silver is, you know, 25 bucks an ounce. A, you know, this phone might only have, you know, a quarter or 50 cents or a dollar worth of silver. It's probably got about, you know, one or two dollars of gold. The gold that you see when you see those fingers, which, you know, on a RAM chip, on a circuit board, those are called fingers. Those are gold plated. Um, takes a lot, a lot of those to get to an ounce of gold. Uh, you know, just thousands of computers. Now, the old computer chips, kind of interesting. If you go back to the uh, first, you know, personal PCs back in the late 80s, early 90s, the 286, the 386, the 486, those actually had a lot of gold in those chips. Mm -hmm. And there might be, you know, upwards of $50 to $100 of gold in those chips. Even, you know, now the more current ones, Pentiums and forward, even though there's gold, you'll see, you know, a lot of gold on them. That's all plating. It takes a lot of gold chips today to get to an ounce of gold. 
Great question, uh, but you'll find gold and silver in all electronics, just a small amount. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions for our metals expert, David? I'm on. Uh, you were kind enough to offer your contact information and the fact that uh, we can send, oh, somebody's, Rich wants to know about gold plate versus gold fill. Yeah, that's a good question. So <clears throat> gold plate is basically electroplated gold, kind of like I talked about with silver. So it's a very minute layer of plating. Now gold filled, there's actually more gold. So if I took this, this rope chain and I cut it and you looked on the side of it and I'm not doing it right now, but if you, if you did, you would actually see a thicker layer of gold with a base metal inside. So gold filled has much more gold than gold plated. It's still a small amount, but uh, much more. So I don't know the mechanics of it. I mean, I think plating is you're dipping it in a bath and it plates onto it uh, that to change it to that gold color where gold filled is a different process. Uh, okay. Yeah, so there's definitely a difference. Okay, anybody else? Call in once, call in twice. Oh, before you hang up on me, Carolyn. So I did a different presentation for Elderworks back for the senior fair a couple months back. Yes. And it was called, it's called Demystifying Gold and Silver. I've given that a few times. And on that presentation, I cover more the history of gold and silver, the history of gold and silver and coinage, the many uses of gold and silver. So that's about an hour. And I do cover this topic. Uh, about how do you evaluate your own, but I only spend a couple minutes on it in that presentation. But if you're more curious about the history, I also talked about how you invest in gold and silver, the different options, mm -hmm. why you sell, how you sell, why people buy. So if you're interested, you can, I, Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong, you can still go to the Senior Fair on the Elderworks website and see those old presentations. You, you certainly can, um, as we're adapting to this new normal, we are recording. And so if your friends have an interest, you can go back out to the Elderworks Facebook page. You can also uh, find us on YouTube. And I do have another question that just came in. Um, All right. Who buys gold and silver? I wouldn't want to go to a cash for gold corner store. Oh, great question. Yeah. Well, if you have items that you are considering selling, of course, I prefer... I'm, you come to me <laughs> and I go anywhere in Illinois, probably go to Wisconsin. Um, I travel all over Illinois meeting with people. I'm very happy to sit down and look at all your items, separate them out, evaluate everything, as long as you, you sell something to me. So uh, if you're in the market to possibly sell some items, you want to meet with someone like me who's going to really take the time. Uh, I do not recommend those uh corner stores, a lot of them went away by the, you know, and, but I know a little bit about them. I don't want to defame them, but I know that the guys that, that worked in those sh shops were trained to offer a very low percentage of the value and then negotiate a little bit, but they were still paying 50% or less than the value, which is not good. So if you're looking to sell items, uh, you know, definitely come to me. Uh, I don't mind competing against other people, but uh, I like to be very honest, straightforward, educational and build, um, you know, I'm, very concerned about my reputation out there. If you're looking to buy, uh, I don't personally sell investable gold and silver. And if you're looking to make an investment, uh, there's several uh, different uh, websites and online uh, dealers. Uh, it could be Ship, uh, Ship Precious Metals, um, Miles Franklin, uh, Kitco, Appmax. So there's some very reputable online dealers where you can buy gold and silver. Uh, but you know, call me, send me questions. Happy to get more detailed uh, with you if you like. Well, and that's great because Elderworks does have a vast network of professionals we work with. And, uh, you know, it takes a while to kind of earn the reputation so that we'll include you in our education. Uh, we do have another question that just came in from somebody that's out of state. How would someone buy silver or gold what qualifications or words? So let me see if I can reread this. I'm out of state. How would I, someone, maybe find someone to buy silver or gold? Um, oh, she says, sorry, I want to sell my silver or gold. So again, Dave's your guy. There's a lot that can be done with those pictures, right? 
Yes, yeah, you can send me images. I can uh, evaluate through photos. You know, I do have people who ship me items. Um, although I'm, I'm just not the biggest fan of shipping gold and silver, in, you know, but it is possible if you have a relative in the Chicago area, if you're coming to this uh, location, you know, I'd love to get together with you. I don't really have other people I can recommend, uh, but definitely would love to have a conversation with you and help coach you through if you're not selling to me, you know, how you can maximize uh, what you're going to get for your items. Well, that's great. All right. Anyone else? What town is David in? You're you're on the North Shore side, right, of Chicago? Yes. Yep. So I'm up. Uh, my business is uh, my business address is in Deerfield. So I'm up here in the North Shore area. I work out of my home, so I don't have an office or a shop. And uh, one of the big benefits I provide is I will go wherever it's most convenient and safe for my uh, clients. So mm -hmm. in most cases, it's at their home. In this uh, time of COVID, I wear a mask. I even wear gloves if uh, people want me to. <coughs> it's kind of cold out, but I could still meet in garages. I've met on patios. So whatever is most comfortable and safe. Uh, sometimes I'll meet clients at their bank, you know, in the safety deposit box area. Sometimes I could meet, you know, I've met in uh, hotel lobbies. Uh, I got but, one more for you, yeah. David. Okay. So, um some of you know that Elderworks has a footprint of brick and mortar in Palatine, Illinois, and we are no longer doing live educations. We're doing basically this, virtual. Um, our office is COVID safe. It is open Monday through Friday from nine until five. And David, as one of our partners, you are welcome to meet any prospective clients. We are on Northwest Highway pretty close to Route 53, just north of Palatine Road. So that's an offer for any of you uh, that want to meet our partner, David Kaz, DMK Metals. Great. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap. Um, appreciate your time. There are some thank yous on the post. Um, after this webinar, you're going to get a, a six-question short survey. And we would appreciate your participation. You know, your feedback is what uh, helps us plan future events. So thank you all for, for coming on and staying on. Thanks, everybody. And thank you again, Carolyn and uh, Elderworks, for inviting me. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.